Hi folks, welcome to this hopefully fairly quick presentation that will get you guys up to speed with some of the different testing methodologies for SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus. My name is Dr. Jason Halsey. I'm a consultant in public health medicine. Uh, and here's the disclaimers. I'm no expert in medical testing, virology or immunology. I've worked in public health for 12 years. Prior to that, a uh, decade of clinical medicine, mostly in peds. I'm presenting here my reading of the science. Please note, as you go through this, where I've put stuff in bold italics, it's because it's my opinion or something I'm concerned about, but it doesn't necessarily have an evidence base to back it up. And the rest of the presentation is as evidence as I can make it. Um, and to make this more useful, we've run these slides by a virologist and others to check their veracity and the content. So just a quick reminder, you will remember from exciting public health lectures and others, um, this grid here that shows you the uh, concepts of sensitivity and specificity. These are actually really important concepts to get your head around in any test. Sensitivity is how good the test is at picking up disease when uh, disease is present. So it's the proportion of people who have the disease who test positive. Specificity is the opposite way around. It's how good the test is at ruling disease out. So it's the proportion of people without the disease who test negative. Also worth thinking about is the positive predictive value. It's the probability that someone with a positive test actually has the disease and the negative predictive value, the probability that somebody who tests negative doesn't have the disease. And we'll come back to those in the end after we've done the rest of the talk so that you can look at these concepts again and just see how they apply to a new disease and new tests. Quick primer about viruses. Um, you guys will know most of this, but as you know, viruses cannot survive on their own. They need the host cell um, both to reproduce and to, to create their havoc. And to do this, they have to be able to get into the host cell, usually by attachment to receptors on the host. And then they like to take over the host cell machinery to make copies of themselves. Usually they use the machinery we have to copy DNA and RNA and the machinery we have to make proteins. So once they've taken over the host cell machinery, they then have to copy themselves and there's two parts to that. One is copying their genetics and the other is making copies of the proteins that they use to get in and out. And they do all of this with the host cells machinery and then they need to get out and spread often by killing the host cell um, or by using various host cell processes to bud off in little vesicles. And then they want to spread out to neighboring cells into new hosts. Now, this new SARS-CoV-2 virus um, is fairly similar to the SARS virus, hence why we're calling it CoV-2. One of the components that shares quite closely with the old SARS virus is the spike protein on the surface here. The spike protein is how this SARS-CoV-2 gets into the host cell and it attaches to angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors on the host cell membrane and uses those to get into the host cell. And then the virus also has a lipid bilayer which fuses with the host cell membrane. Lipid bilayer which is sensitive to detergents and to alcohol which is one of the reasons why we can kill the virus quickly by good hand washing. And then when it gets in, it injects its RNA and takes over the host cell machinery to make copies of the viral proteins. And it does this using the host cell's endoplasmic reticulum, the machinery we've got for making our own proteins. And then the viral RNA, it makes copies of itself uh, using an enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is a, um, an enzyme it creates from its own code, but using the host cell machinery. Now, um, there's two basic tests for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, and this is the virus that causes COVID-19, just in case you didn't know that. The main one that you will have probably heard the most about that we've been doing the most of is this PCR test or polymerase chain reaction. And to collect this, we need a viral swab of the throat or nose. Um, probably nose is slightly better than the throat, looking at what we've seen so far in terms of picking it up. And what we're looking for in the swab is to see if there's viral RNA present. Can we see little pieces of the virus's genetic code? The other test that you might have heard about and that uh, we're hoping is on the way but has been 
challenging to develop so far is this antibody test or ELISA test. And this is a blood test in almost all of the antibody tests that have been proposed so far that I've seen anyway. They are looking in the patient's serum to see if the, the patient has made antibodies to that spike protein, that protein for getting in. Spike protein, as you remember, attaches to that ACE2 receptor to, and uses that to get into the host cell. So uh, an antibody to that would probably help to, um, if you've got a high level of antibodies to that, then A, you've probably seen this virus before, uh, and B, you may well be immune to it, although we don't know that for sure now. What's important to recognize is these are two very different tests, and we'll go through that a little bit more in a second. So the first test, the polymerase chain reaction test, is looking for viral RNA. This is a basic process which we've used for, for many years now um, for amplifying small amounts of specific sequences of, G, of DNA or genetic code to get a detectable amount. Because you're starting with viral RNA, in this case, you have to use what's called reverse transcriptase, an enzyme to convert the RNA back into complementary DNA. Um, and then what we do is we have a, a primer that recognizes sequence in the DNA and preferentially copies it so that we get lots and lots and lots of copies for that cDNA that we're looking for. The number of cycles that you use to do this is refers to a, a cycle of sort of heating up and then cooling to amplify up that uh, DNA. And then you can use some sort of detection method to look for the DNA afterwards. We usually use immunofluorescence these days or in the old days, gel electrophoresis. That fact that this needs a number of cycles to amplify it up is, is useful for us. And we'll go on to in a second. So strengths and weakness of the PCR test. The main strength of this is it can detect relatively small amounts of viral RNA. And by seeing how many cycles you need to get up to a detectable level, that can give you some kind of estimate of the patient's viral load or how much virus is present. We assume that this test is highly specific. By that, I mean that if you get a positive test, you can be pretty confident the person is or has been infected. And the reason we say that is because we're looking for specific sequences of the virus's RNA, which are unlikely to be repeated anywhere else. Now, weaknesses of this test, the sensitivity is probably not perfect. Uh, you may well miss cases where the infection is early and the virus is not detectable in the upper airways yet. And this virus likes to replicate in the lower airways, so the swab is not perfect for that. Doing swabs on people, a good nasal swab is supposed to make your eyes water. Um, it's quite unpleasant to do them properly. A good throat swab should make you gag. So often there's a chance that they're not being done as uh, effectively as they need to be to get a, a positive result either. The biggest weakness of the basic PCR test is that it's not quick. Uh, you need time to collect the sample. You need time to transport it to, the, to a lab. In many settings, you would need quite a well-equipped lab to run this. And then you would need to run through those cycles of growing up the DNA um, and then verify and report it. So there's a good sort of 12 hour turnaround for this. Uh, another weakness of this is that, and this is in bold italics, so recognize this is conjecture. It might detect bits of viral RNA after the virus has been cleared. So we, we think that the virus may be pretty much dead, but you might still be finding bits of RNA in the respiratory tract. Because that basic PCR test is a bit slow um, and cumbersome to do, uh, there are some various clever variations on that PCR test that are being used, particularly in this outbreak. PCR RT lamp or reverse transcription loop mediated isothermal amplification. This is a, a process that basically speeds up the PCR process quite dramatically. Um, it allows amplification at a single temperature and it's much faster uh, by doing sort of clever work with the cDNA folds. This can take about 30 minutes to an hour to run. It doesn't need as much high tech kit. It can be done in smaller labs or potentially even in a car park setting. It can be done by lab staff who are less well trained, but it does need specific primers and kit to make it run. So um, you can't just uh, pick it up and run it wherever you want to. At this stage, it is probably showing similar results to PCR in terms of the detection. Now, before we move on to discussing the antibody test, let's just do a quick revision of humoral immunity. So humoral immunity is the process by which you become uh, immune to a lot of infections that you've seen in the past. 
Uh, and just to remind you, cellular immunity, uh, the cells like T cells and macrophages that eat up or uh, engulf the infectious agent and the infected cells and then present any foreign antigens that they find to the immune system. And this is a, a non-specific part of the immune system. We, we call it because it can do this for pretty much any invader. By contrast, humoral immunity uh, is when uh, mediated by the B cells is when um, they've been presented with antigens by the macrophages and the T cells. They start making antibodies to those antigens. And then the B cells, which are um, turned on, if you like, make copies of themselves as well. So you get rapid amplification of the ability to make those antibodies. When I say rapid, uh, I mean days to weeks rather than it's two hours. But this uh, B cell humoral immunity, B cell mediated humoral immunity probably provides us with lasting protection that's specific to the disease. But here's the challenge is that mounting an antibody response like this takes time. Um, so antibody tests are looking to see if somebody has antibodies to the proteins that make up the virus. Uh, and as I said, the obvious target for most of the antibody tests that are being looked at for COVID uh, to the SARS-CoV to spike protein, which it uses to get into the cell. Currently, we've got tests, uh, a variety available, so looking at both IgM and IgG antibodies. Some are also looking at IgA antibodies. It's a, a blood test. You, you're looking in the patient's serum, so a finger brick test is possible. Now, this test does have major limitations. Um, it probably will test negative ones. Somebody still has the virus because the immune system has not started producing enough IgM and IgG to be detectable yet. Uh, and as at the time I wrote this on the 10th of April, um, we still don't know how immunogenic infection with this virus is. That's still true today on recording at the 22nd of April. We don't know if everybody who's been infected will develop antibodies. We don't know if having antibodies to the spike protein is necessary to be immune. And we don't know if people who have antibodies to the spike protein are going to be immune to recurrent infection or at what level of those antibodies you need to have to, to confer immunity. So that leaves us slightly in the dark with how to use this test at the moment. Um, and there are significant risks that the public get hold of the test and use it on themselves, perhaps ordering it over the internet and find that they test negative, despite the fact that they're actually infected and probably infectious because they're in that early period, um, that period drawn in yellow here where the virus is growing inside them, but their body's uh, antibody response hasn't been properly generated yet. Now, I'm just going to quickly talk about how different testing policies affect both how much COVID we detect and what we will see reported as the death rates. The more you test, the more likely you are to pick up less severe cases of disease. And that's probably where we are in Germany, where they've been doing a lot more testing than we have in the UK. And we're early on in the outbreak. They managed to get their testing up and running and we're testing more widely in the community. As a result, you can see that they've reported a much lower death rate because they've identified a lot more cases of less clinical severity. By contrast, in the UK, we've sort of changed our testing policy a couple of times. Initially, we were testing return travellers predominantly, probably when we already had some community spread going on, we, we were still doing that. Then we switched to using the testing facilities we had, because we've got less of it than Germany, using the testing facilities we had to do a lot more testing in patients who are severely infected and to try and keep up with the diagnostic process. Uh, and then we switched our focus again to patients who are severely uh, ill, but also trying to test staff, particularly in, in the hospital settings, so that we can try and reduce the nosocomial spread of disease. With all of those different approaches, you can see in the UK, we're probably picking up a lot less disease, in, particularly in the community setting, and our death rate looks a lot higher as a result. There's a, an interesting uh, report that's just been out recently, but needs more confirmation. In the worst affected area in Germany, they used the antibody test to look for what proportion of the population might have been infected. Uh, and they found that about 15% of the population in that city had been infected. So in that case, that would bring the case fatality right down to about 
0.4%. And that's probably what we're going to find in the UK when we when we finally do a proper wash up and we're getting all our community testing online. Now, going back to that slide, do you remember that sensitivity and specificity, positive and negative predictive value? Remember here that sensitivity and specificity are characteristics of the test itself. They tell us how good the test is at doing its job. But usually to calculate these numbers, we would usually have some kind of gold standard to compare with. But this is quite tricky in this case because it's a new disease and we don't even know how good our gold standard is. At the moment, most places are using the PCR as their gold standard, although Ideally, the, the ultimate gold standard would be to sit down and see if you could grow the virus in viral culture. And there's very few places in the country that are set up to be able to do that or even in the world. So we're, we're sort of flying a little bit blind with trying to work out what the sensitivity and specificity of this test are. We assume the specificity to be very, very high. If the disease is identified, then you've probably got it the sensitivity, the ability to pick up the disease, that doesn't seem to be quite so high. Now, remember those concepts of positive and negative predictive value. Those are numbers that are not a characteristic necessarily of the test alone. They vary depending on how much disease there is within the population. So you can imagine if you've got a high prevalence of the disease in the population, there's a very high chance that somebody who has a positive test has a true positive test. But because we're not testing everybody in the community, we don't know how common this is. So we can't calculate numbers like positive and negative predictive value. I hope this has been a fairly uh, quick, but hopefully useful romp through the two different testing approaches that we've got at the moment for this virus. Good luck on the wards.